More than 2,000 kilometers long, the Tanzara Railway, built in the 1960s by the Chinese, Tanzanians, and Zambians, has crafted the decades-strong China-Africa bond. The upcoming FOCAC summit in Beijing, where leaders from the African continent and China are expected to bring a stronger feeling to the joint de development of billions of people. What does the Tanzara Railway mean to the spirit of the China-Africa bound today? What can we learn from or about China-Africa relations from decades of history? And how do we strengthen the bonds inherited from our forefathers? To gain some insight into such matters, I'm very much honored to have His Excellency Dr. Salim Ahmed Salim, the former Prime Minister of Tanzania in Beijing. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to Dialogue, Dr. Salim. Thank you so much. You are a household name for China. President Xi Jinping said in his keynote presentation in Davos that we live in great times and also worse times. So what does this mean for the China-African ties philosophically? It, it, means, it reinforces our position that we need to strengthen the China, Tanzanian, China-African relations. Because in this context of uh, difficult times, we need each other. In the, in the context of uh, happier times, we also need each other so that we work together as a team, as a group. What are the challenges? Well, the challenges are many. I mean, for, for example, in the case of Africa, the challenges of our development, poverty, which, which really uh, makes our life, the life of our people very difficult, the challenge of conflicts, internal conflicts, which are yet to be resolved, and uh, the, the, the challenge of uh, trying to get things together because we have a lot of decisions which have been, have been made by our leaders and our countries, but the question of implementation becomes a problem. So the, the challenge of implementation is also a challenge. When mentioning China-Tanzania and China-Africa relationship, the Tanzara Railway, built in the 1960s, has become a landmark achievement for both sides. We know the operational condition today is not perfect. What are the problems? Well, I think mostly technical difficulties are there, uh, and uh, the fact that, of course, it has stayed that long. But basically, the problems are not political. The problems are not uh, uh, that we, they, we are regretting the, the, the Tazara. Tazara continues to be an important link for Zambia, Tanzania, and the country of Southern Africa. An important, and important link of the relationship between China and, and, and Tanzania, and China and Africa. So really, if you were to point out one particular project which, can, which speaks it all, speaks for itself, it, the extent of commitment which China had for Tanzania and Zambia, and vice versa, in terms of having this, uh, found this, this, um, uh, this, this unit, uh, becomes very important for, for our countries. And you have to remember that without the Zambia-Tanzania Railway, the struggle for freedom in Zimbabwe would have been extremely difficult, extremely difficult, because Zimbabwe was, in effect, was made to depend, basically, on, on, on Southern, the, the Smith regime in Southern Rhodesia, or the South Apartheid regime in South Africa. So by having the railway provided, a, you know, an opportunity for the African countries to keep on st providing support to the liberation movement, uh, and uh, the friends of Africa, also especially China, to provide their support to the liberation movement at a very critical time. Let's look at the issue of governance. Uh, quite a few years back, I was surprised by a leading article of uh, The Economist, a prestigious journal about problems in Africa. And uh, the British uh, politicians and elites argue that governance remains a chronic challenge for Africans. Uh, you can provide them with the relief foods and humanitarian assistance, help them uh, one way or another. But the issue is whether Africans are able to run their own economy independently, other than the political independence. So what do you think of uh, any improvement of uh, things like governance? Well, they, I mean, with all due respect to my British, British friend, uh, I do not accept the thrust of his presentation. The fact remains that Africa has made a lot of, a lot of progress in the area of governance also. Uh, 
transparency, accountability, and all that. But the fact remains also that, um, you know, as I say, Rome was not built in a day. And so it takes time, but more importantly, there is a, there is a commitment within Africa to ensure that the governance continues, good governance is, it should be, you know, a key factor. Uh, transparency, you know, accountability, these are things which are very important. Whether, whether you, you know, wh 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 whichever country you come from. And by the way, uh, with that, uh, there's no need to exaggerate, but the fact remains that even the, even the, the, the countries which are very well developed and can claim they are more advanced and all that, they also have problems with governance, or one, one nation or the other. So what I'm saying is that for Africa, governance is important. We need to ensure that good governance prevails. We need to ensure that our people have, you know, the, the, you know there, is, the, there is a respect for human rights, there is respect for, uh, for, for, you know, for local decision making and so on. The issue of uh, colonial legacy remains a controversial one for African elites and politicians. Let's look at the massacre in Rwanda in 1994. What lessons can we draw? Well, the tragedy in Rwanda uh, resulting in the killings of almost, uh, almost a million people for that matter. Uh, it's a tragic tragedy not only for Rwanda, it's a tragedy for Africa. In fact, also, it's a tragedy for the world. Because when people saw it coming, when the massacre started going on, I mean, there was reluctance on the part of some members of the international community to do something about it. Uh, I, can, I can tell you, well, at that time I was sick general of the OAU, and I can tell you we tried our level best to mobilize international opinion. We, kept, we made it very clear. It was not a time for the United Nations to withdraw its troops from, from, from rather it was a time to reinforce our troops. Unfortunately, our voices were not heard and uh, the, 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 the consequences that we, we all know. But the fact remains, yes, there are problems. I mean, to be, we have problems in Africa. We still have problems in Africa. We still have problems of conflicts. We still have problems of uh, and, you know, underdevelopment. But things are moving at the same time. And there is the, the new generation. There is also the fact that um, we, we learn from the experiences. And by and large, I'm saying we are, mo we are on the right track. But we cannot afford complacency, we cannot afford to say, ah, we have reached there, because we haven't reached there. There's a long way to go. But what do you think of the post-war reconstruction and national reconciliation under the leadership of President Paul Kagame in Rwanda? Well, I'll say this. Uh, uh, President Kagame has done a lot. Uh, in fact, he's done a remarkable thing. I mean, I've been to Rwanda several times. And I was there just before the genocide, and I was there when the genocide was taking place, in a sense, and we were there after genocide. I can assure you, really that Rwanda is now almost a completely different place. They have made tremendous development in terms of socio-economic transformation, in terms of particip people's participation and so on. So th that is one example which can tell you that, look, if there is a will and there is a determination, things can be made possible. And Africa, all those who think that are nothing, nothing good comes from the continent should also learn from what happened in Rwanda. That government is known for being one of integrity under President Kigami. How serious is corruption for uh, many of the governments in the sub-Sahara region? Well, first let me say corruption is corruption. And really it's the number one enemy, not only of Africa, but of a number of countries. Corruption also is it's not a monopoly of Africans. There are a lot of countries, all you have to do is just read, read the papers, Western papers, by the way, and you see the, the number of incidents of major corruption taking place in, many, in some of these countries some of which are supposed to be, we all seem to be think, thinking that they will learn from them. Excuse me, the point of my question, Your Excellency, is that, uh, to my knowledge, most African countries have not only become politically independent, but in the wake of the Cold War, most of them have been transformed into young democracies, which mean they have the independence of the media, they have opposition in the parliament, and therefore corruption should have been minimized one way or another, according to the uh, principles of Western uh, pol political science and their political institutions. Now, you, you have copied many of the Western institutions in pursuing democracy. And democracy, the glow of it, has mesmerized so many economies. That's true. It's true in, in the following sense. It's funny, because uh, you are saying that really what the, something went wrong because we tried to emulate 
the Western type of the, 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 the claims by the Western countries that their governance can survive there, but good governance is a problem in Africa. The others will think, that, look, and I am one of them, I think, frankly, good governance is something which comes out as a, you know, a logical desire of our people, the desire to be an independent country, the desire to ensure that the, the, the voices of the masses are listened to, the desire to ensure that um, uh, corruption does not run supreme. Now, unfortunately, right now, many African countries have a problem with corruption. Many. But I'm saying this thing should also be taken you know, in its due proportion. Yes, Africa is corrupt. But who are the corruptors? If you look at the corruptors, you find that the very country, some of the very countries who keep criticizing Africa or being corrupt are the very ones also who are, in one way or the other, contributing to corruption. And so we all have to do something. We are, Africans have to do something more. The, our friends in the West, including some of the international institutions, should do, should do something better. We all want to see a free, a corrupt, free society. That's the only way you can ensure real progress and economic, social development of the continent. Today, uh, in line with the 10-point proposal that uh, President Xi Jinping rolled out uh, during the China-African Summit Dialogue in Johannesburg, where I was there to attend or to cover. China is currently engaged with a massive uh, program of industrialization. Do you think infrastructure is the critical defining point uh, for the future of Africa? Well, I think so. I think the issue of infrastructure is ext extremely crucial for the uh, development, especially the economic development of the continent. Uh, and um, this is realized by our state. African states do realize that. I mean, there are more and more countries now putting a lot of emphasis on the, on the development of infrastructure. And uh, the infrastructure really relates to many things, you know, whether you talk in terms of rural development, whether you talk in terms of economic development in the urban areas and so on. You need to have proper, secure, dependable infrastructure. And, and so uh, I really think I welcome very warmly the position of the president in support of Africa's efforts in infrastructure. China it comes under fire from Western countries for allegedly not doing enough to interfere with internal affairs, for example, to criticize uh, uh, some of the poor governance of the host countries. Uh, China says our policy is one of no strings. What do you think of our official response towards the Western criticism? Well, I think that's the right response. Well, we, we do not, we're not saying that therefore everything that is happening in Africa should be just before, should just be watching. No. We are saying that you can criticize where the, where the arguments for criticism are there, where the, there's a basis for that. But criticizing a random criticism really doesn't make sense and doesn't help. And in any case, African states are particularly, particularly resentful of any idea of trying to tell them how we should eat and how we should dress and so on and so forth. So in a sense, uh, the criticism against China, uh, for me, does not have any basis. I mean, we are saying that China has always been providing assistance. We appreciate this assistance and in any way, in any case, I mean, any attempt to try and say, look, because you are providing too much assistance, something is going wrong with Africa. On the contrary, I think we need more assistance. We need more assistance also from, from the Western countries. We need assistance which is, you know, without, you know, uh, condition, conditionalities. The conditionalities certainly cannot help the process of change in Africa. In the process of industrialization, when we look at what China went through over the past four decades since this year witnesses the 40th anniversary of China's opening up and reform, township enterprises uh, became a very extraordinary phenomenon for the Chinese economy. And I'm wondering if small and medium-sized enterprises uh, could also be uh, one important part of your national economy, because in this area, I'm afraid, um, many people could become employed and do you think China has uh, established uh, too much of uh, this uh, a trivial and medium-sized, small medium-sized uh, business uh, presence? Today, it seems the Chinese embassy is calling for more introduction of uh, big enterprises to undertake massive uh, industrialization. 
Uh, what do you think of the different stages of economic and social development when we look at the issue of small and medium-sized enterprises? I think you need a combination of them. You need small, medium, and medium enterprises being supported, and you need also the big, the big industries also being developed, being supported. So it's not a question either, either or. It's a question of what can be done at the moment. And in, in some cases, large enterprises, large industries becomes more relevant. In some cases, the other, the other becomes more relevant. So we, we, we think that um, w one of our major problems in the continent, of course, is the gap between what we aspire for and what is possible. We aspire for a, a free continent, a continent which is dependent on its own resources, a continent which is fighting corruption, genuinely so, a continent which really has enormous resources but has this contradiction. We, I can't, a continent with a lot of riches, like one of the richest continents in the world, and yet we are a country, continent which has some of the poorest people in the world. So this is, this is contradiction in terms of, we have to, as Africans ourselves, we have to overcome this. We have to make sure that really the, the people do enjoy the benefits of their products. You are watching Dialogue with Dr. Salim Ahmed Salim, former Premier of uh, uh, Tanzania and uh, also former Secretary General of the Organization of African Unity. Currently, he is the Chairman of the China-Tanzania Friendship Association. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Come back, sir. Thank you. Today, G20 has replaced G7 in the wake of the 2008 financial meltdown, and therefore multilateralism as well as uh, the rise of emerging markets promise to change the political landscape of the world. But above all, the brainchild by President Xi Jinping to construct uh, interconnectivity through the Belt and Road Initiative has caused a lot of criticism and suspicions from the West. Now, we've been talking about the issue of infrastructure and industrialization in developing countries. What do you think of the role China plays in shaping a new world economic landscape? Do you think we are too ambitious? Do you think we're going to replace the old world economic order? Is China a threat? No, I think China is a threat only to those people who are determined to see Africa perpetually, perpetually dependent. But China is not a threat. China is an important contribution, has made an important contribution in Africa's efforts for economic and social, social development. Uh, obviously, um, those who do not, ask wish, do not wish for us well, they will give you uh, so many reasons why you know, Africa is not yet ready, Africa is not ripe for this, Africa is not ripe for that. But I can tell you frankly, Africa is more than ripe for economic transformation. Uh, we need certainly to ensure that um, the, the sufficient resources are put for the development of the continent, especially in the area of industry, science and technology. Uh, obviously, the demands are many, and it's not one, no, not one individual African country can have all these benefits. So we, that's why we talk in terms of collective, that's why we talk in terms of the continent in 2063, how it will be. In other words, there is a recognition within our continent on the need to have greater cooperation, greater coordination, greater harmonization of the position of Africa. In which case, then we can work very closely with our Chinese friends in dealing with some of the perpetual problems that face our continent. The focal point of the disputes between the United States and China is they don't accept strong central leadership. And yet, in the Chinese perspective, from Chinese perspective, strong central leadership will guarantee the order and investment environment. So what do you think of the mode of Chinese development for African countries? Do you think you will not be able to copy our model or do you think there's a lot you can learn from China given the current disputes uh, between the West and China? Well first we, we try our level best not to be in the midst of disputes. We, our, our objective is to try and see that we get the cooperation and the friendship of all countries, the Chinese and other uh, countries. Uh, so that's, one, that's what we desire. But you know, the world is not something which you desire. Because you desire, you get it. No. Uh, I don't think at all that you can say that China's position right now and China's contribution is a threat. Certainly it's not a threat to Africa. On the contrary, I think China's rule uh, 
has been extremely important in supporting Africa's efforts towards economic emancipation. Uh, and this is something which is not just a slogan. Uh, we, we fought for freedom uh, and we made a lot of sacrifices for that freedom. Thank God we, with, the, with the freedom of Mandela at that time and the, uh, the, 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 the democratic dispensation in practice in South Africa, okay, okay, we have now won, won the political freedom. But political freedom alone by itself is not enough. You have to make sure that uh, the, the, the fruits of the, the people's struggle are seen. People have to see physical evidence that, okay, things have changed. And that those can only, this can only happen if, really, the legitimate aspiration, the legitimate demands of our, peop our people are met. And so countries like China, which have been supporting African countries, have made a significant contribution in the realization of our objectives. The Tazara Railway that was built in the 1960s is, of course, a landmark image of the friendship that testifies to our mutual trust during the Cold War. However, with the end of the Cultural Revolution and the end of the Cold War, it seems most of China's economic assistance for our uh, brothers and sisters in developing countries uh, are stopped uh, uh, to be unconditional and they must, based, they must be based on market rules, namely Chinese authorities and entrepreneurs do enjoy, do hope to enjoy the return of the investment. And do you think our African friends feel comfortable with the change in our attitude and policy? Well, of course, obviously, uh, when you have something which is given as assistance, it's different when you have something which you have to pay back. So that is, that's, norm, that's normal, it's, it's, uh, there's nothing strange about that. Uh, but I think, really, uh, we, we have to go through, African countries have to go through the process, they have to go through, they have to appreciate that this is a new, new world, we're talking of globalization and so on, provided that this, the, the, the stress on globalization does not in any, in, you know, uh, undermine the efforts which are being made by individual African countries. Because really, you know, those who talk about Chinese threat and so on, they, 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 they have in mind that any, the type of assistance or the type of cooperation that is extended by China to African countries is not so. I mean, so from that point of view, we should go back to the situation in the past, where really everything was wholly dependent on the Western world. Now, that, will not, that, that, that thing will not come, come back again. Given the pretty rich deposits in Africa, very much like what happens in the oil-rich Gulf states in the Middle East. You suffer the problem of a resource curse. Today, in the age of globalization and the internet economy, China could export uh, digital technology and the use of uh, smartphones. Do you think uh, the digital technology has helped to close the gap between rich and poor between developed and developing countries or the other way around? What digital technology has done is to make people, more and more people conscious of their own responsibilities and more and more people determined to, to ensure that uh, this is done in the interest of our people. Uh, so I, I think that um, things are changing, the world has changed a lot and uh, it would be foolhardy to say, okay, we have to do things the way we are doing so ten years ago, or twenty years ago, thirty years ago. We have to live with the situation as it is now. In other words, take into consideration the legitimate interests of our people, but also the legitimate interests of those who want to help us. So it's a question of, uh, I would say, balance, balancing, ba balancing the situation. But I would, I wouldn't, I would, it would be nice, but I don't think that really China can go back to the situation to the status quo until, say, forty years ago or fifty years ago. That's different China. But China continues, can, be, can make an important contribution by continuing to be supportive of the efforts which are being made by African countries. Now, of course, as I said before, one of the ironies of our continent is that we are a continent with rich resources, tremendous resources, to the potential is absolutely almost infinite. And yet, we have the poorest people in the continent. So this is a contradiction. So these contradictions must be addressed and addressed effectively, and the only people who can address this contradiction are the African countries and the African people themselves. We appreciate your spirit of self-reliance. Um, China is also criticized for the alleged new colonialism. First of all, your definition about colonialism, given our common memories about the past. Yeah, of course. 
They also talk of Chinese you know, colonialism well. I, do, I don't think maybe they've had, they've ever had an experience of being under colonialism. But those who have been under colonialism were very clear on what is new colonialism and what is colonialism. We have gone through that, we have suffered, and that's what, that's what kept led to mobilization of our people, mobilization of our resources, to things to see to it that we try to serve our people the best we can. Now, um, I, I know that uh, this does not please everybody. There are those people who are always skeptical about Africa, it's always skeptical about whatever happens. An incident can happen in the States and can be related to Africa, or it's happen in Tanzania or, say, Uganda or any of these places and related to others. So every country, I mean, one of the, thing, one of the things that people should know as far as the continent is concerned, we are a continent that trying to work together. But we, it does not take away the fact that we are individual African countries, 54 African countries, and to think in terms of 54 African countries, rationalize their position, you know, coordinate their position, I think it takes, it takes, it takes a lot of effort. Full CACA will take place in September in China. What do you think will be the major issues? Underdevelopment, and basically how to really, really live up to the expectations of, the, of, of, of people. You know, one of the serious threats uh, to, to, our, to our security uh, is actually to ensure that our people are given the opportunity to enjoy the benefit of what they produce. Now, what is a, I would hope that Foka will really concentrate again on the Libya. How do you strengthen the South in order to ensure that there is serious development both in the North and the South? Now, the Foka is something which we uh, in, in the continent consider very important as, as providing tremendous potential for such cooperation. What do you think of the future of the United Nations? Uh, will it remain a convincing talking shop or a practical platform for development and the issue of security? Do you think China will, will do more to enhance the authority of multilateralism on the platform of the United Nations? So really, Yes, I think it's important for us to ensure that the, the universality of the organization is respected and for the United Nations itself to come up with new ideas. Because the UN is the only, international, the only institution which covers everybody in the world. And so the UN should be more and more involved in crisis situations, in socioeconomic development and others. But which means also the willingness of the member states to, to provide the resources to, to, to the UN. And talking of China, I also read the entry of China, the restoration of China, Chinese people's rights to the United Nations has made a big difference. Now you have really, I, I think it has in, in, in enhanced the effectiveness and the capability of the organization to deal with crisis, both uh, internal crisis and international crisis. Thank you so much for being so appreciative of China's role and for making historic contributions to the friendship between Africa and China. I really you. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy our hospitality yes, here yes. in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.